speaker is uh, Peter de Lehmans, uh, who will speak about uh, translating Aristotle in the Middle Ages, an exploration of, in parentheses, possible multilingual digital collections. And, and Peter, please also present yourself so we will know where you come from. I'm uh, Peter de Lehmans uh, from the University of Leuven. Uh, I'm there one of the I'm working at the Institute of Philosophy and I'm in charge of one of the persons in charge of the Aristotle's Latinus project about which I will tell you now some things. Uh, I should start with two things. First of all, to thank the organizers for having invited me to be here, which is strange for me because I should confess immediately that I'm not familiar at all with digital collections or uh, I know how to use them but I'm not really involved in, in, in creating digital humanities. So uh, when I'm here, it's more as, uh, as to beg you for help in, in trying to realize uh, what, what I will propose. What I will do indeed is presenting what we have done already so far and then uh, saying what perhaps we could do more. Uh, but let me start perhaps with um, an introduction on Aristotle's Latinus for those of you who do not know it. Uh, it's a project uh, founded many years ago, 1930, 1929 and 1930, by the International <coughs> Union of Academies. Uh, its original aim was editing all medieval translations of Aristotle made in the Middle Ages, so both Arabic Latin translations and Greek Latin translations because this evidently requires different skills. The project was redefined in 1971 when there was made split between the Aristotle's Latinus stricto sensu, which edits the Greek Latin translations, and then the Aristotle's Semitico Latinus, uh, created by, by Johann Rosser Glulofs, uh, uh, which edits, uh, among others, the uh, Arabic Latin translations. Um, so I will be talking about this Aristotle's Latinus uh, stricto sensu, so the Greek Latin translations. Um, chronologically, these translations cover pe a period from Boethius until uh, 1295, the translation of the economics by uh, Duranus. Um, just for, that's what I already said, so the Aristotle's Latinus is an international project, but it's coordinated by uh, the Institute of Philosophy at Leuven, uh, so the, uh, the Wolf Mansion Center for uh, of Monsignor Center for Ancient and Medieval Philosophy. Uh, we are also collaborating, it just is a promotional talk, we are also collaborating with uh, Lectio, which is a, a quite recent center on pre-modern intellectual history. Uh, uh, but it's an international editing project, uh, which means uh, that uh, our editions are made by uh, an international team of scholars, although we find it increasingly difficult to find skilled editors. Uh, it is perhaps uh, typical for our present situation that one of our most active editors is Gudrun Vuillemin, whose picture you find on the bottom, but uh, Gudrun Vuillemin is 82 years old, but she's still our most active editor. That's the that's present situation. Uh, for, her, for the two other pictures you have on top, you have the editions, the typical editions of the Aristotle Semitico Latinus, so the blue series is the, uh, the, the series I'm responsible uh, of. Uh, now, what I will do is uh, first say some things about the state of the art in Aristotle Latinus, what is the work that has been done, and then in the second part of my paper to present these possible digital collections. Um, Very quickly, just to give you a survey, there are many translations of almost the whole uh, Corpus Aristotelicum. Uh, what has been published, you find the catalogues, of course, more than 2,000 manuscripts. Uh, all logical works, which uh, were the first to be edited by Mino Paluello, translation of metaphysics and so on. Uh, some natural philosophy and some other things. But what is more important, it's something that's sometimes forgotten and I want to stress this because sometimes funding organizations say we should not invest money in Aristotle's Latinus because it's an old project and everything has already been done. That's not true. There are some really main translations that still remain to be edited. There are two main chantiers. Uh, it's the, uh, the Suda Aristotle, which almost entirely remains to be edited. Uh, most, uh, the most important translation of those are Bartholomew of Messina, of the Physiognomia and the Problemata Physica. Uh, 
but even more important, much of natural philosophy remains to be edited. So the, these huge translations of the physics, de Cairo, de Generatione Corruzione, which exist in hundreds of manuscripts, still need to be edited. These are huge tasks, but we, well, we can't, it's difficult to find money and editors. Um, now, for the present purpose, it's probably more important to, to say uh, these are translations. Uh, so, where in an edition of Aristotle's Latinus do we discuss the, uh, the, the relation between the Greek and the Latin? We do it on three occasions. The first is evidently the introduction. Uh, what is the main question we will ask? I should say, it's not, we do not consider it, uh, it as our task to, to, new, to do new research on the Greek tradition. In principle, we use existing research. In the facts, you see that very often we do uh, have new uh, things on the Greek tradition to offer. Uh, but the main question we will ask is, is the model of the translator still excellent? Uh, most, in most cases, it's lost. In some cases, it is excellent, as in the famous uh, Vienna manuscript. Uh, if the manuscript is not extant, then we will try to, to see where this lost model must be situated in the Greek tradition. So we will uh, try to uh, uh, position it in the Greek stemma. Um, more important for what I will say later is the second thing uh, that in the, uh, we will also document the relation between Greek and Latin in the actual edition. Uh, it's unclear, but we have an edition with a double apparatus. On the bottom you find the Latin apparatus, Latin variants. Uh, the first apparatus in the middle is the comparative Greek-Latin translation uh, apparatus, uh, which is, in fact, quite peculiar. What is information you will find there? That is, it will document only those places where the translation deviates from if the model is extant from the extant manuscript, so these will very few places, or if the model is not extant, we will compare the translation with the extant manuscript that is the closest to the model. Huh? So in, in my case, it's, it's from my own edition, I have compared, you can't possibly see it, it's, uh, I have compared it with a, a manuscript, the model is not extant of the Progresso Animali, I have compared it with a 12th century Florence manuscript uh, with a single uh, CA. Um, now, I would like to, to stress the importance of this, this decision uh, to, to document only those passages that is for, for, which is sometimes confusing for users of our editions. Namely, uh, first of all, uh, we will not document those passages where at first sight there appears to be a divergence between the Latin and the Greek, but of which we as an editor think it can be explained by translation method. I'll, say, I'll give some examples in the second part of my paper. More important, that's also because our editions are used by, by uh, scholars who uh, study the reception of uh, uh, a given term, or by Greek scholars. It will not report the relation between the Greek critical text and the Latin translation. So it, it only documents the relation between the translation and its model. So why is this confusing? Because sometimes Terms that are evident, evidently in the Greek text, uh, will disappear from, from, from our editions. Um, but again, I will come back to this later. The third place where we, where we will talk about the Greek is uh, the, the Greek <coughs> Latin indices, uh, which are fun to make, I think. Uh, that uh, at the end of every edition, every editor is given a uh, complete uh, Greek Latin and Latin uh, Greek index. Um, again, a, a particularity of this indices is that what is the Greek text that these are, indices are made on? It's not the critical Greek text, but it's the hypothetical Greek model uh, that we compare with the Latin translation. So, um, this means that every Latin work will be joined by that Greek reading that we believe uh, that has been rendered by, by the translator, even if this reading is preserved in only one Greek manuscript. So the, the textus recaptus, Greek textus recaptus, might be missing from the, uh, from the indices. Uh, also, when we 
uh, conjecture uh, uh, a Greek reading. It will <coughs> this Greek reading that will be in the images. Evidently, we will indicate that it's a conjecture and, and not say that it's a... Uh, but I'll, I'll say some words about the implications of this when, when creating uh, what I think could be a possible digital database. But before I do so, let me say some words about uh, we are not completely old-fashioned. We have also a Versotus Latinus database, uh, which was created for the first time in 2003. Uh, there was a second release in 2006. Uh, there will be a new release later this year in which we will also insert uh, translations of Greek Latin commentaries. Uh, it was created in uh, collaboration with CTDoc, which is now CTLO and Brepols, which who is also the uh, district, uh, also distributes our uh, printed uh, books. Uh, and it's also integrated then in the, the Brepolis cross database search tool. Um, what text you find there, you find the, the mainly the blue volumes you have seen before, uh, and also some other text, but that's something I will not discuss here. Um, more important is that, uh, to say something about the information that is found in this database, namely it is only the bare text. You cannot search the apparatus, you cannot search uh, the, um, the introduction. It's just the text. Does, uh, the, from a there are several reasons for this which we could discuss during the break. Uh, from a scientific point of view, the function of printed books and databases is just different. The database can be used for identifying Aristotelian sources, uh, quoted in other medieval texts. It is also useful to for some linguistic research, but its disadvantage is that it's monolayered. It gives only the critical reconstructed text, it gives no insight in, in the relation with the Greek. Um, the problem, of course, is that uh, if you're looking to identify sources, medieval sources, that the text quoted by a medieval author will rarely correspond to the edited Latin text. It will be a particular manuscript that is quoted by, by a medieval author. So you can identify the places, but you will have to return to the editions to actually look at the apparatus and so on. Um, I have added uh, one more thing uh, about the Greek words. Uh, we also encountered this problem. Uh, sometimes a, translator's, a translator leaves a Greek word uh, in his Latin translation because he does not know the equivalent. Uh, for the moment, uh, it's, uh, when the database was created, it was not possible to have Greek characters in the Latin database, so they, uh, we have transcribed the, the words in Latin characters, and it's followed in the database by this uh, G, uh, which is one advantage. Of okay, you can then get this uh, epistemic monicon uh, Greek. Uh, this approach has evidently its disadvantages. The advantage is that with a search action uh, uh, asterisk uh, and G, you can find immediately every place in the Aristotle's Latinus database where a translator left the Greek one. Um, now, this brings me to the uh, challenge of, of what, what, what uh, of, uh, of digital collections, I think, that's visualizing semantic shifts in medieval Aristotelism. Um, what is the present situation? Uh, that's just one of our manuscripts. Um, we have the present situation. The printed books do pay so uh, do pay attention to the fact that these are translations, but do so in a somewhat par a peculiar way. What I said about the apparatus <coughs> and the index, whereas the digital collection in its present state is almost exclusively a collection of Latin texts without any relation with the Greek. One could then wonder, I think, if in this increasingly digital area one cannot find other additional ways to highlight the relevance of Aristotle's Latinus and to put it in a more evident multilingual uh, perspective. Uh, I will propose two uh, options, but I should immediately add that they still belong to the virtual world uh, and do not take into account uh, practical questions such as finding uh, money and skilled collaborators. Only very few of Aristotle's, ed, uh, Aristotle's Latinus editors are left, and also involving in a digital project, it's very challenging, it's very useful, 
but also the editorial work still remains to be done. Um, the first thing is creating a bilingual, or why not, a, a, a trilingual or multilingual uh, medieval uh, corpus aristotelicum, um, in which we would indeed confront the Greek text immediately with the Latin text. Uh, I think this should be preferred to put both things in one column, which should make a close relation uh, uh, between them, also with, with sticky notes to explain certain phenomena about which I will talk about. Now, the thing is that if, if you make such a corpus, you should go further than just put the Greek, connect the Greek critical text with the translation. You should also indeed uh, uh, consider the thing in the middle, that's the Greek model, the Greek accent. <laughs> um, so, I think the task should be double. Uh, on the one hand, we should compare it with, we should be able to compare the Latin translation with the Greek model. If it's Greek model, then we could just <coughs> reproduce the, uh, the, the, the Greek uh, model uh, and a transcription of it. Uh, the advantage of such an approach would evidently be that you would not need to look in this comparative Greek apparatus or in the apparatus, uh, in the apparatus of the Greek edition to find all variants which correspond to your translator, but you would see immediately the, the thing. Uh, if the model is not excellent, of course, then we would need to create our own Greek model in, in this time. Uh, the other thing is we would indeed also need to, to enable a comparison between the Greek and the Greek model and the Greek and the, and the Latin translation. Um, indeed, because sometimes translations are based on such terrible Greek manuscripts that there is a huge semantic gap between <coughs> edited Greek text and the Latin text as it circulated in the Middle Ages. Now, what would be the challenges be of such a uh, thing? I think there are two of them. Um, the first is uh, already something I have already uh, spoken about, that's uh, the um, reconstructing the Greek model, which involves editorial choices. Um, as I said before, it's the editor who decides which Latin word he or she finds normal translations for a Greek reading, and which ones he or she thinks presuppose another Greek variant. This sounds very evident, but sometimes it's not, and evidently, in these non-evident cases, this will have, been, have an impact on the database if we want to create such a database. Uh, what, will, what, are the, what are our uh, thoughts when we try to guess the reading behind. Uh, it can be plain semantics, uh, for example, if there is a, in the Greek tradition, if some manuscripts has fuse and uh, so uh, nature and other has psyche, soul, the Latin has anima, we will think that uh, the, the Greek model had indeed psyche. Uh, but sometimes things are less evident, for example, with the translation method, uh, I just take this, this almost meaningless uh, particle uh, te, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Greek font has been lost. Um, when we look at uh, Moorbeek, for example, we see that in most cases he will omit the particle, he will not translate it. Uh, in other cases he will translate que, um, so the enclitic que. Um, if then all manuscripts have te, but the Latin uh, translation has no counterpart, then if we can reconstruct our model, we will say uh, we can leave that in our hypothetical <coughs> Greek model and say Moorbeke did not translate it. But very often with these particles we get a situation in which some manuscripts have te, other manuscripts omit te, <coughs> and in that case we do not know if a translator, if he decided not to translate it, or if his Greek model just did not have the data. Um, we will also take into account, or need to take into account other factors that, that, that uh, might have played a role, namely misinterpretations uh, from the side of the translator, which are uh, common. Uh, I give you two examples. Um, uh, they are both taken from the translation of the Problemata Physica, by Bartholomew of Messina, 
the first is taken from a section about the ears. Uh, it's about the redness of the ears. Uh, and on a certain moment you find in the Greek text toi psyche in the cold. And the ears are uh, hanging in the cold. Uh, and in the Latin translation you will find ab anima. Hmm? From the soul. Uh, Two explanations are possible, I think. Uh, all Greek manuscripts have here toi psyche. Huh? Uh, one could indeed say he must have seen another Greek variant. The other thing is that, that the equivalent of uh, uh, anima would have been te psyche, which in, under the influence of, of the, uh, the uh, 13th century pronunciation of uh, Greek would be very close to toi psyche, so psyche. So one can indeed think it must have been another variant. We can also say it's an, an error made on the influence of Catholicism and just leave Psyche in our reconstructed treatment. Um, second example is uh, taken from uh, the first problem of section third, which is a rather famous one about melancholy. Uh, it's asked why uh, uh, if uh, melancholic people are lustful, uh, the Greek is erotikoi, from eros. Um, the Latin has interrogativi, uh, asking questions. Uh, and the commentators on this passage have quite some difficulties to explain this. Now, again, we can have the same, the same train of thought. Uh, namely, um, we can think, on the one side, we could argue that Bartholomew's Greek manus manuscript did not have eroticon, but a non-attested other variant, and here we could, for example, think of eroticon, eroticon, uh, so eroticon, which means indeed uh, lustful. That would be one possibility. On the other hand, we have perhaps a more economical solution, that is that it might well be that Bartholomew's manuscript did have eroticon, so the reading of all manuscripts, but that it was Bartholomew who misinterpreted and linked it to erotao, to ask, and thus created an adjective based on, on interrogare, interrogative. Uh, if I were to edit this text, I would leave erotikoi in the reconstructed <coughs> Greek, I have to come on, in the reconstructed Greek map. Uh, but you see, these are choices one has to make and which, which influence uh, uh, decisions. Now, this brings me to the, the second challenge. Uh, until so far, if, if you deal with passages uh, that are... Um, so, sorry, the observation that Latin translations have their own peculiarities, which are only seemingly in opposition with the Greek text, also reveals the, the limit of reconstructing the Greek model used by a translator and coupling it to the Latin text. So what I've done so far will as will not suffice to reveal all semantic shifts that happen between the Greek and the Latin. So it will reveal only those shifts that are due to variation in the Greek tradition, but not those that are to, due to peculiarities of the Latin text and that still might deeply influence its translation. So this is, if a translator makes a mistake or uses a very strange equivalent for a Greek word, this might highly puzzle interpret later interpreters and might also cause uh, a shift between the Greek and the Latin. Uh, I'll just give you a small example. I will not elaborate it. It's semeion. It's, uh, um, it's translated by a 13th century translator of the Motu Animalium by uh, punctum. Uh, <coughs> as such, not too strange. In a mathematical context, semeion can indeed mean punctum. The problem in this passage is that it's Semeion is here in its more common meaning. Uh, uh, there is a sign, there is evidence that. Hmm? Now, you will indeed see that, that if a commentator has to interpret a passage where he reads punctum, where actually <coughs> there is meant is there is evidence, he must make lots of efforts to give a, some kind of interpretation. Uh, and I think also that that's why I was talking about the sticky notes we should add in the database. Just linking text, we should find ways to, to more evidently visualize these semantic shifts made under the influence of the Greek model, but also made under the influence of translation techniques. Um, 
expanding this, uh, I was talking, I said bilingual, we could expand. Uh, ideality, but now I'm just dreaming, we could also, we could uh, involve other translations, we could also involve commentaries, although then a direct word by word linking would not be possible anymore. Uh, again, it's the first case, if we were to, to, to put also commentaries in this text, the complication would mainly be in the fourth, the translation accent, that is, uh, if we were to link the commentary to the translation, ideally that we would link the commentary to the Latin model of the translation used by that commentator, which expands considerably. And the last thing is uh, that that's uh, for Daniel Jacquard that I have added this, um, which would be, I think, a, a nice project, but probably too complicated to carry out. That's to, to visualize semantic shifts from the Greek up to Ivar de Conti, so the Middle French translator in 13, um, a translation made in 13.8. What is the complication? Ivar de Conti uh, makes a translation of the problemata, but in fact he somewhat uses Bartholomew's translation, but he also translates an even more a, co a Latin commentary uh, <laughs> written by uh, PDA Pietro d'Avano in 13.10. So, in this case, we would need to find the model of the translation uh, that Evrard used. We would also find to find the model that Evrard used of Pietro's commentary and so on. So, many ways to expand such things, but probably we start better with the first part of, uh, uh, of what I exposed. Um, do I still have one minute left? Uh, I will be very brief about this. This, I think, is... Um, um, the second project, it's the Dictionary of the Medieval Translator. Um, I've uh, spoken about all these indices we make. All edit uh, every editor makes his indices individually, although we need to check constantly other indices to find attestations of a given translation in other works. Uh, the question then is if this still makes sense. It, sometimes one has, even for a text which has barely been read, one finds an index of some 150 pages. Uh, does it make sense? So, yes, perhaps it makes more sense to do this in a digital environment. Uh, that would be the first step, but probably going further, it, I think it, but that just be a stupid idea. Uh, perhaps it would be nice to integrate, or it would be beautiful to, to integrate all existing indices of Aristotle's Latinus volumes so that we have some kind of dictionary of the medieval Aristotle, Aristotle translator. We could also add other non Aristotelian texts so that we get a glimpse of what knowledge of Greek, of Greek Latin translators in the Middle Ages was. There are also challenges which I will not discuss in detail, you will find it on, on the, the text which is on the, the drawbox. Uh, that is, if we were to integrate existing indices, is that I have to confess that not all our editors have worked equally uh, thoroughly. Uh, some editor, some uh, indices are made, really report everything, others are rather selective. Uh, and also, while we reconstruct uh, the, the Greek model, that also has some influence uh, on, on, on the thing. Uh, just for the, the unevenness of existing in the chest, uh, the, you know the Greek article uh, does not exist in Latin, um, but uh, translators will most often omit it, but sometimes they translate it in various ways depending on its function, its position, its complement. Uh, just to illustrate the unevenness, Goudron uh, Vuillemin, in her edition of Meteorologica, gives one page in her index of, on the article, giving really every <coughs> reference with all functions, etc., etc. The edition by Drossakulovs of De Generatione Animalium, the article is completely absent. Uh, so, well, that's an unevenness we are confronted with. Uh, should this mean that we should not start with such an enterprise? That's of course another discussion, but I'll stop there.